Hello everyone, welcome to another lesson today. Today we're talking about the uh, Declaration of Independence. We've been learning about all the things that have been upsetting the colonists that the British have been doing. Like taxes, these acts, the Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Tea Act, Intolerable Acts, controlling their trade, and all that. So now they're kind of coming to a boil. Um, the Declaration of Independence actually was signed after the war already begun, but we're going to talk about it first. So we kind of understand why the colonists are, you know, starting this war and and what this important document was. Um, so first off, the name, and you should be following along on this handout that goes along with it. I'm filling it out as we talk about it, and I'll write some on the board too. The name. What does Declaration of Independence mean? Okay, the, two, there's two uh, vocabularies there: Declaration and Independence. A Declaration is like a statement that you're declaring something you're saying this is what we think this is how we feel this is our statement independence you should know is uh, to be free to be alone to be left alone and in this situation in the context the colonists want to be free and left alone of from great britain so what you write for number one a little tape on here yeah i'll just leave it there for now one colonists want to be free from Britain. Let me see. Uh, There still. Okay. Let's see if I can move with less glare. There we go. Let's do it. All right. So I want to be free from Britain. Next, the preamble. And I actually have. Uh, very own copy of the Declaration of Independence right here. It's uh, it's worth millions of dollars. I actually got it at a garage sale from about three seventy five. But um, let me read this next part. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we got to put that into our own words. So I'll break it down a little bit. So we hold these truths to be self-evident. That's what we're saying. Like what we're saying should be obvious. They're self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, this should be pretty self-explanatory too, right? All men, everybody. We're going to be talking about just men though, because at the time they didn't consider women equal. Are created equal, like are all the same. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That's saying that they are endowed or made by their creator, right? I'm talking about God. There's only two creators, you know, God or your mom, but they're talking about God here. With certain unalienable rights. That word unalienable, it means that they cannot be taken from you. Saying that people have certain rights that should not be able to be taken. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You should know that liberty means freedom. So what it's saying is that all men, everybody's equal, They're, and we're given from God certain rights that shouldn't be able to be taken away. The right to live, the right to be free, and be happy. So you kind of put that statement in your own words real quick for number two, if you want it, if you have to. Um, number three asks, why is, uh, why is this ironic or controversial at this time? And that word ironic basically means like, you say something, but it's the opposite of what's actually happening. Um, and it makes it almost funny in like a weird and sarcastic way, but not, not necessarily funny, but um, strange or different. Controversial means like people are going to debate about it or debate the, the truth of it. So the part we want to focus on for that is where it says that all men are created equal. This is back in 1776. Okay, and people certainly weren't treated equally at this time. Remember, the colonists are writing this because they want to be free from Great Britain. They don't feel like they're being treated fairly. 
But at the same time, many of the colonists, including Thomas Jefferson, who wrote this beautiful paper himself, was a slave owner. So that is very ironic that he is going to say all men are created equal when at the same time he's owning slaves. So for number three, just right. Three, slavery is legal, meaning it's allowed by the law in the colonies. And um, number four asks, do you believe people have inalienable rights? So that's a question that you need to answer on your own. Do you believe that people have rights that can't or should not be taken away from you? The ones they list here is life, liberty, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, maybe you could think of your own, but for number four, I always lose right down. Uh, do you believe that and why? Uh, I'm going to grab a something to erase this real quick. You can fast forward this part. All right, sorry about that. Next section. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. Okay, so let's talk about what that means. The question asks, what is Jefferson saying needs to happen when a government is not working? That's the first question in that section on the bottom there on the front page. So in the text, it says that Whenever a form of government becomes destructive, it is the right of the people to alter, meaning change, or abolish, meaning end it. Okay, so what Jefferson's saying needs to happen when a government's not working is exactly that, that people need to alter or abolish it. So if the government's not working, this would be number one at the bottom. It's not listed with a number, but there's two questions at the bottom there. They need to change. That's that alter part. Or abolish it. And that word abolish is a good word to know. Um, we start talking about slavery and about abolishing slavery. That means ending slavery. So Jefferson's saying, if a government's not working out, you need to change or just completely end it. Um, the next one in that section asks, how does this relate to the situation in the colonies before the revolution? Well, the colonists, as we've been talking about, they're not happy with the British government. They feel like it's not working for them, right? That they're just taxing them, passing these laws, hurting their trade. So... It, it relates directly to it, right? The colonists were unhappy with, okay, we said the British government, but it's important to know what the British government is called and was called at this time, right? We have the King, King George, but the government around him, right, they have a limited monarchy, is called the parliament. So we need to know that term, and we're going to write it in this answer. Parliament. There you go. I'm going to flip to the next side. Okay, this is the part of the declaration here that... Um, Thomas Jefferson and the colonists really start getting after Great Britain and uh, kind of saying what the whole beef is about here. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. Okay, so the question asks, who is Jefferson blaming 
for the wrongdoing to the colonies in this section. Well, this one is pretty straightforward, pretty obvious. I'm just going to slide this down. That's a it says right in the text that the history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries. So they're directly addressing the king of Great Britain. And we want to know him by name. Right? So hopefully you know it right now. But for that one, remember, we're on the back. Now it's the first question on the back. His name is King George the Third. See that all right? It's a little hard getting this without the glare and everything. King George the Third. And what does he say Great Britain has done to him? It says him, but really I mean how they done to the colonies. And the text says, it's a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, okay, and a direct establishment of an absolute tyranny. When they say that ab absolute tyranny, a tyrant is like a, an evil ruler that rules with complete power. So they're accusing the king of becoming a tyrant, of ruling over the colonies with complete power. So for that one, we could just write repeated injuries, Right, that's right from the text. And becoming a tyrant. All right, remember, the word tyrant is like any, uh, a, a strong leader that usually rules a complete power and unfairly. Okay, we got two questions left here and one more section to read. Okay, this section is uh, where Thomas Jefferson starts listing all the things that a Great Britain has done wrong. He goes on for 28 counts of different things, but there are four listed here. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing to assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. Number one asks, what does this section intend to do? And I kind of went over it already, right? He's listing things that Great Britain did wrong. Okay, but there's a really important word that we need to know when you talk about the things that Great Britain was doing wrong. Okay, and that word, we've gone over it a few times already. So it's gonna be the next section, so I'm gonna draw a little line here. That word is that he's listing there, the word I was just referring to is grievances. Right, that word that means problems, issues, things you're upset about grievances against Britain. Next one, it just says to name one of those grievances the Jefferson and the Continental Congress has with England. So let's look at these examples. I'm gonna pick the last one. To me, that's the easiest to understand. So it says, he has kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. So what that means, he's kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without consent or agreement from our legislatures or governments, saying that the king, the British government has kept their armies in the colonies, even in times of peace, when they really have no need to be there to watch over them. Right? And the, the, the colonists don't like that. They don't like being watched over. So for number two, they keep their armies in the colonies even 
during peace. I hope you can see that all right, even during peace. That's it. So that's really the Declaration of Independence, right? It gets into some of the country's ideals, like all men are created equal, and that we have rights that we should enjoy, even though it was a little ironic of them saying that. It starts getting into, you know, what Britain gets did wrong and blaming the king, and then lists all the individual examples of what happened. But um, this will be your notes for the unit, for uh, the Declaration of Independence. Make sure you put them with in your binder with the other notes from the unit for when we have that uh, note check coming up. When you are done, uh, raise your hand and you will actually, sorry, you could today you actually go right into uh, the next ad puzzle. There is an ad puzzle uh, on the battles of the American Revolution. It's a video. It's not me teaching this time. That'll be tomorrow. But it's a video, so go ahead and start that ad puzzle. It's called Battles of the American Revolution. Thank you.